Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Leanne, I'm an alcoholic. So, um, I just need to preface today. Uh, I am a total honor to be asked by Bill, wherever he went, to speak about Step 11. Um, but he did so really, like, bursting, I think. And um, I had a, this is my, this is, this step for me was the most transformative step in my recovery. I will get emotional, just letting you know. Um, but when he said that, I rearranged my, my schedule today to make sure that I was here because that's how important this step is to me. And so I have Ronald McDonald makeup on because I ran in, in a fun run today and I had a Ronald McDonald outfit, which um, I almost wore here, but I had time to go home and change. So be glad. We're not a glum lot. Thank God. Um, so, you know what, I, I really have no agenda of anything that I'm going to say except for offering up my experience, strength, and hope when it comes to Step 11. Um, and, and to do that, I kind of have to go backwards and give you a little bit of my story. So, um, I, I drank a lot, and um, drinking started for me kind of at a young age, I was 13, um, and I never, ever drank um, normally. It's not like I drank every weekend in those days, but I certainly never stopped. I was the girl who couldn't stop drinking. I was the one that had to be babysat. I was the one that had to be chaperoned because once I started drinking, I was either the girl that was going to barf, pass out, or, like, uh, wander away. Um, And that was the pattern that – but back then it was fun. I'm a chaser of fun. And uh, so back then I was always the fun girl. Uh, I don't know why they thought that was fun, but, you know, I, I, that's how I drank. And that's how I thought everybody drank. And um, But then everybody went on to college, all my friends. I'm from the Bay Area, and all my friends went on to, uh, to college. And I didn't. I stayed behind. And that pattern of partying uh, continued on in a way, like, all my friends grew up, and they, they went through life experiences and, you know, um, matured, and I didn't because I drank. Um, whenever I had an opportunity to do to drink, I took it. And so, you know, the patterns that established in, in an early uh, time in my life was that I never knew how to process anything. I never, um, I never knew how to uh, have fun. I never knew how to mourn. I never. The worst was being bored. I never knew how to be bored. Um, and that applies specifically to step eleven for me, but I'll get to it later. Like being alone with myself. Uh, drove me crazy, and so th- that was when I would really drink a lot uh, and, and check out um, because I didn't have anything else to do, and I thought it was funny, you know, let me just get drunk, and, you know, I would I would make jokes about um, cleaning out the liquor cabinet, you know, like it was spring cleaning time, and um, and then I'd be checked out, you know, I'd be passed out on the, on the couch or somewhere at home, and that was the pattern that started for me, and what happened, you know, I can go through all the drunk log I mean, I have it all, um, I was the girl that um, I was functional. I was a functional alcoholic. So I held down a job, and, you know, I have an ego. That is a huge character defect of mine that I hope is under control now because I have a connection with my higher power. But back then, um, holding down a job for me meant that I could drink. You know, I can drink like a lunatic because I brought home a paycheck. And um, and I was working like a lunatic. I was working like 80 hours a week. And, and, you know, I look back on it now, and I think that was my way of drinking, you know. That entitled me. You know, I was miserable. And so checking out every single night. And at the end of my drinking, I was blacked out every single night for probably three years of my life. I lost three years of my life to this disease. And um, I thought that I was all okay because I held down a job, I took care of my responsibilities, and um, I was good. But... In uh, well, my first go around of sobriety was in August of 2005, and um, I got to the point where I was just really sick of the consequences. Um, to be honest, as I look back on it now, I never wanted to stop drinking. You know, I didn't. I didn't go and get help because I wanted to stop drinking. I went and got help because I wanted somebody to teach me how to drink like those other people that can go to a bar, have one drink, and go home. 
Um, that's what I chased for years of my life. I, I wanted to be able to drink like a lady and not suffer the consequences of everybody. You know, the next day, the next day was always the worst. I would wake up. I would not know what I did the night before. I would not know who I called the night before. And I got the looks of everybody, you know. And I knew I did something. But I had no idea what it was. So let's just not talk about it and pretend it didn't happen. And that was the pattern for me. Um, so when I started getting help in 2005, the person that I was then was uh, extremely hateful. I never lost my contact with God, but I was pissed off at God. Um, I knew that I had a God in my life. I always was raised um, with God in my life, and I knew um, that there was a God. There was never an atheistic view in, in my world in Luan Land. Um, but God turned his back on me. You know, I knew that God could, could have me drink like one of those people that could walk away, you know, have a couple drinks at a bar and have a good time and walk away and not, you know, be stumbling out of the bar or peeing her pants or barfing in a car, you know, all the things that I suffered when I was in my disease. I knew that God could take care of that for me, but he wasn't. And I was mad. Um, I remember my prayer life at that time in my life consisted of a lot of middle fingers to God, um, lots. Um, I remember saying it. I remember telling him to just F off, get out of my life, you know, uh, you're, you're not helping me. And I realize now that what I was asking God to help me with was to help me drink. I wanted to learn how to drink, and I never prayed right. And therefore, God let me stay in my disease for a little bit longer. And um, I went to a rehab, and I did everything they told me to do because, you know, that's, I'm, a, I'm a Virgo and you do the checklist. And I got it all taken care of. I peed in the cups. I went to all their, you know, I didn't, my ego didn't want to go to AA. So I went to a rehab thing and then was shocked when they told me that I was going to have to go to four AA meetings a week. I was like, no, 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 no. That's what I'm paying you to do. But, um, yeah, that's the person I was. So, uh, yeah, then I, because, you know, my ego told me as soon as I went to an AA meeting, everybody there would know me. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's just not me anymore. It's so not me. But that's where I was then. I I was going to get control of my drinking and be okay. Um, but, but what I really want to impress upon you is that um, I, I was what I am now, and I will get emotional. Back then, I was, um, I compare the insides of me to, like, rotten Swiss cheese. It was it was a hole and it was black and I hated everybody and I hated how I compared to everybody because that's what I did you know that was what Luann in Luann land I never had confrontations with anybody I in my head was the judge and the jury and I had trials and I put people up on the stand and I would you know in my head question them get them all tried and sentenced and either kick them out and never have anything to do with them again or work it out without them ever having any conversations with me about it at all. And um, that was where I was at the end. I was uh, Internally, I was gone. I had no idea who I was. Um, I didn't like who was presenting herself as me because um, I hated everybody. I hated life. Um, I, I walked through life... Um, angry at my children. I didn't, they were bringing me down. I couldn't drink the way I wanted to because I had these kids that needed me. Um, I was angry at my job that provided a check that I, you know, used as a reason to drink. I was angry at my husband for not being able to help me. And um, I hated everybody. And um, I begrudgingly went through these steps because when I went back out again, I went to a wedding at um, six months of sobriety. I went to a wedding and I, uh, they were, they gave you a choice. Um, and, and choice for me in sobriety is a huge deal because we have choices now. And the choice they gave me was that I could either have this much of apple cider, you know, in a little flute, or I could have this much of the champagne in a little flute. And my disease whispered to me that I had six months of sobriety and I got it all controlled, you know, um, go ahead and have that one inch of, of champagne. And um, I kid you not, I was at a wedding where I didn't know very many people with my kids in a, in a state outside of California. And uh, as soon as I took that one inch, I could feel it right now, no champagne, the demon inside of me that is my alcoholism, um, got, he got the megaphone. And I left that. I couldn't think. I couldn't have fun. I couldn't, I couldn't hear the toasts going around. I couldn't hear the joy. I couldn't be a part of anything going on at that um, reception. So I left the reception and charged two bottles of wine to the bride's room. Proceeded to drink it, and then I left my kid with people I don't even know at the wedding and um, proceeded to drink two bottles of wine that night, and that started about a six-week bender where I don't remember anything um, because I knew enough that this wasn't going to last. 
I was either going to have to start the sobriety thing again or I was going to die. Um, that's how I drank. And um, so I was going to get in all that I could in those six weeks. And when I got to my second round of sobriety, I had that um, the, the gift of desperation. I was desperate and I was scared to death because I could not believe how uh, that disease, it took me over. I was possessed by my disease. And but that was a good place for me to be because I had to empty myself of me, what I thought I was then, in order to work these steps with rigorous honesty. And, um, you know, I did the steps. I, I want to fast forward to step 11 because um, I, I, I started working with a sponsor who worked a very firm program. And I, I wanted her because she intimidated me a little bit. And I knew that at that point I was so scared that I, I, I didn't need wishy-washy. I didn't need, um, you know, someone to uh, let me manipulate because I'm a good manipulator. Um, I needed somebody who I respected enough to be a little frightened of. And I, I chose my sponsor, and thank God she was available um, for, to take me on um, because right at that time my entire life started to change, and I didn't know how to handle it. Um, my father went into a... Um, convalescent home, and uh, I tried to control everything, you know, And but she told me to remain, remain small, and that's something totally new to me, because when you create this land of delusion that you're the queen of, and, um, you know, you, you make all the decisions, and everybody is wrong when they disagree with you, um, your ego's pretty big, and I, um, I had a really hard time being small, but at that time, I was still pissed off at God. And I didn't really want to. I didn't really want to do the whole God thing. Um, so the AA group definitely was my higher power when I first started here because I didn't want to have anything to do with the God that let me down. Um, but you know, these steps are so magical, and they're put in this order for a reason. Because um, I gave my my will and my power over to the AA group, and I took suggestions because that, at that time that's all I was able to do. And um, I went through all the house cleaning, and I did everything my sponsor told me to do. At that point, I was um, like that gift of desperation meant that I would do anything that she asked me to do. I say in a joking way that I would have walked across the Golden Gate Bridge naked if she told me that it would have had something to do with my sobriety. And uh, I probably would have. That's not too far from the truth. Um, so... When we got to step 11, though, uh, you know, we worked all through the steps, and, and by that time, I had I had a glimpse of this. The obsession to drink was, was lifted, thank God, um, and I had a glimpse of, of the, the promises, the peace that, that's offered in this program, and, um, and I was willing. I was willing to start opening up my mind to a God as I understood him and, and start um, looking at that as opposed to the, the AA group. And keep in mind, I didn't start Step 11 until I was uh, two and a half years sober. So um, it, I took the steps nice and slow, and that's what that's what I needed to do. And I think that as as I guide other um, people through the steps, I allow God to work on the pace. I don't dictate the pace because um, some people, one of the sponsors that I have who's in this room and I love her very much, um, she blazed through these steps. But you know what? You could see God working in her, and that was God's will to have her. She's got some sort of purpose that needed her to get through these steps quickly. And me, I took two and a half years. And so at two and a half years, I was at step 11. And um, all I can relate to you as far as guiding somebody through step 11 is, is how I was guided through it. And uh, my sponsor, bless her heart, I remember this very clearly. It was in November of 2008. And she started me here. And uh, I read step 11 in the 12 by 12. And, uh, you know, just like I think Jill was talking about as far as sitting on a beach and all that stuff, I was like, uh-huh, <laughs> right? Um, I got prayer down. I mean, it was very clear that prayer was a petition to God, and I was really good about giving all these lists of things to God that I wanted, you know? Like, um, I was really good at the laundry listing to, to God. Um, and the part about step 11 that, that really rang true for me as far as prayer goes is that I no longer... Pray. I was no longer to pray for myself, and that was a total shift for me. I'm like, well, what do I pray for? Oh, wait, other people. Imagine that. And that was the whole beginning of me being really small. Um, she had me work really hard on humility prior to doing step 11, and I think that I had enough to know that I did not know what was best for me and, um, and to take her suggestions. And so the first thing that I started working on was the St. Francis Prayer. And for me, I know that this is a very personal um, step, 
but um, it has so transformed my life, and I'll get to a little bit more of that in a minute, but um, the St. Francis Prayer, when I meditated on it, I was to take it really slow and read each petition as a meditation. Instead of just reading it, like, you know, rote prayers for me um, don't really work because it's just I can memorize things, but my head at all times is concocting a thousand different things going on. I'm laundry listing all the things that I have to do, and I'm thinking about, you know, the responsibilities that I have going on, and I'm not at all paying attention. I find myself doing that now with the serenity prayer even. You know, you get something memorized, and you just, you're not paying attention to what's going on. But when I quiet myself, when I started to quiet myself and 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 work on the St. Francis prayer, my life started to change. Because when you pray to God, you know, I have now a God that works in my life. It didn't he didn't work before, but that's because I wasn't um I wasn't praying correctly. I was not initiating a relationship with my higher power in a way that allowed him to work in my life. You know, I was initiating a relationship with my higher power on a list of what I wanted in my life and what I thought everybody else should have in their life. And um, I got real humble with the fact that I wasn't to be praying for myself at all, but to be praying for what God's will is. And um, one of the very uh, first things that my um, sponsor had me do back at step three was to take a week and, um, and really get real with what it felt like to be in my will and what it felt like to be in God's will. And I know that that sounds really simple, but um, it has been something that has changed my entire sobriety because what I learned from that it was that when I'm spinning out and when my head is going a thousand different directions and I am not present with this, the current situation that's going on, I am not in my will. And when I know that, when I can determine that, then I can, do, I can turn that will over and I can work the steps with humility. But if I don't first know when I'm in my will, then, um, then I, don't, I don't have any direction. But when I'm in God's will, things are peaceful and things are calm and happy and, um, and intuition is, is, is there. And so when I quiet myself um, and, and sit with God, she had me do that for the first week. Uh, actually, it was two weeks because the way she took me through this step was to practice something for two weeks because that's, I, I guess, scientists or someone with authority says that two weeks establishes a, a pattern in your life. It's the way to get a habit started. So for two weeks, I was to do the prayer as it is in the big book, you know, where in the morning I wake up and I ask God to direct my will on how I can be helpful to um, another alcoholic and to other people around me because we do practice these principles in all our affairs. So um, that's what I did every morning, and um, in the evening I retire and I think I, I, get, I get real with my gratitude on what I'm thankful for in my life. And so for two weeks, that is what I did. And um, I started getting... Um, a bigger, a, a broader perspective of what my God was. Um, and, and it was the, the program and its suggestions to find a power that works for me was huge because what was, what was introduced to me my entire life was not working for me. And um, when I started to, to melt away all the stereotypes that I had in my head of what God was in my life, I was able to expand him to something that is so much bigger than, than I ever had before. And prayer started that. Um, but really, my, um, my, my biggest impact with Step 11, it has to do with meditation. Now, I don't know how many people know, but I, um, I have a bit of a reputation for being a new agey chick, and that's okay. That's okay because that's where I'm at. And um, I'll, I'll take that because what God has done for me in my life, um, if people want to put that in a box as being new age, I'm okay with that. Um, but it says in the 12 by 12, um, because there's a lot of um, stigma about meditation, especially, um, I don't know, in, in the religious organizations. Meditation is practiced in every religion. Um, and in our steps, we have 11 steps. So there's 11 suggestions in order to get from that place of desperation to the promises. And as part of step 11, it's, there is meditation. And it's not, it's different from prayer. For me, meditation uh, or prayer is, is asking, you know, asking God for guidance and, and to direct your day. But meditation is that part where you listen. And I'm not a good listener. I, I, you know, when I came to this program, I wasn't a good listener because I was doing it all in my head, and I didn't need your input because it was all happening in here, and your input just messed it all up because, you know, the reality of it didn't matter in the way I'm at. Um, and so I started to get quiet, and I'm just telling you right now, I hated it. <laughs> My sponsor had me start with a minute. No, she had me start with five minutes. 
of just sitting and being quiet. Um, and well, and first let me just read, because it says in the 12 by 12, um, there's a direct linkage among self-examination, meditation, and prayer. Self-examination, step 10, meditation and prayer, step 11. Taken separately, these practices bring much relief and benefit. But when they are logically related and interwoven, the result is an unshakable foundation for life. And that's not taking one, you know, it's not, um, I don't get to cherry pick this program because um, when I do, that's putting my will into it and I, I don't have anything to do with the obsession being lifted, lifted from me, that was my higher power. And when I start putting Luann into these steps and my interpretations of me into these steps, I mess it up. So, um, you know, meditation is a huge part of this program. And um, you could do it any way you want to do it, you know, it's, it's just getting quiet. But the impact that it's had on my life has, I chased this piece like I did the drink. You know, I chased that party. I chased the fun that drinking used to be for me before it became a nightmare. Um, and now, um, with what has happened to me through these steps, I chase that piece. I chase my emotional sobriety because um, without it, um, it's, I'm only a few steps away from drinking again. So... Um, I started with the St. Francis Prayer and meditating on that and, and sitting with, you know, Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. Where there is hatred, I may bring love. And just sitting there and allowing God in my life with that prayer as um, as being a channel for love and peace. Um, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness. That where there is discord, I may bring harmony. That where there is error, I may bring truth. That where there is doubt, I may bring faith. That where there is despair, I may bring hope. That where there are shadows, I may bring light. Where there is sadness, I may bring joy. And this was an important part of the prayer for me. Lord, grant that I may rather seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, because I wanted everybody to understand me, and it's impossible. To love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is dying that one awakens to eternal life. So I sat with that as it suggested in step 11, and she said to do that for five minutes. I would start by praying that, and I would try to sit for five minutes. And um, just as all the other suggestions that my sponsor has given me through the, the six years of sobriety that I have had, what I resist the most has had the most impact on my life. And now, thank goodness I'm open to suggestions and learning and, and, and actually incorporating those lessons into my life because now when something rubs me the wrong way, when a suggestion happens, when somebody says something in a meeting that rubs me the wrong way, I instantly know that I need to listen, that that's something that I need to either put into my life or um, or just hear and allow. And that wasn't me before. You know, before um, I didn't allow anybody's opinions into my life. And, um, and so... Meditation for me, it started in August, I mean, in November of 2000, um, actually going back into October of 2008, and she told me to sit for five minutes, and I could not turn my head off. And my head goes a mile a minute, I have things to do, I'm a very busy person, and I've got lists, and, you know, so I would start in on the Lord's Prayer, and I'm like, okay, let me be a, a channel of thy peace. And I'm like, oh, yeah, i got to go wash the car today, and I, oh, did I pay that bill? I can't remember if I paid that bill. And um, my head doesn't shut up on a normal basis, and it never did. And that's why drinking was so important to me, because it would go, so I would, I would be in the future, and I would be trying to solve all these problems that didn't ever exist in my life yet, because I was, you know, years ahead of myself, or I would be in my thoughts, lamenting the past, regretting the drink, regretting all the stuff that I did in my life. I would never be right here. Um, and so uh, it was very difficult for me to do this step. And um, so for two weeks I tried that for five minutes. And I'm, I've learned to be very honest with my sponsor. I'm rigorously honest with her. I said, I don't know, it didn't work. Uh, five minutes, I, I can maybe do 30 seconds of turning my head off. And um, so she told me to go to the store and get a timer and sit with the timer and try for one minute at a time. And I did. I went to the store and I got a timer and I set it there. And um, after a minute, my head was still going crazy. I couldn't, I couldn't turn it off at all. And so then um, she had me, she had me, I remember for another two weeks, she had me say, just allow your thoughts to come in and go out. You know, and I thought, oh my gosh, you're so pokey. Okay, I'll allow the thoughts to come in and then go out. But the thoughts would come in and they would just get stuck there, you know. Um, and so I tried that for two weeks and I came back and I said, no, it didn't work for me either. Um, and then in February, uh, February 9th to be exact, that was when I met with her. I met with my sponsor on Sunday. She told me, I told her I just can't do this. 
I just can't do this. Let's just move on to step 12. I'll continue to work it. I promise. Um, you know, but it had been three months, and I didn't want to get stuck there forever because I hated it. Um, so she told me, Luann, you need to get a mantra. And I was like, a mantra? What are you talking about? I mean, do you go to a store and get a mantra? Do you go online and look for a mantra? I didn't even know what a mantra was, and I thought this was way too out there for me. But I do what my sponsor tells me to do, and at least I take her suggestions. And so I said, okay, I'll find the mantra. And this is where God took over this step in my life. Because um, I'm not kidding you, the Saturday after, it was on February 14th, I was talking to somebody completely unrelated to anywhere. It was actually somebody in Las Vegas, and it wasn't related to anybody in this local program. Nobody who knew anything about where I was in my step work or anything. He stops and he says, you're going to think this is really, really weird. And I'm like, what? He's like, I'm supposed to give you a mantra. And when that kind of stuff happens, you can either laugh at it, but who says that? Like, who who says? It? First of all, when she told me to get a mantra, I was like, okay, right. But who, I mean, it, to me, that shook me up. It was enough of a shock to where I was like, holy cow, I need to do this meditation stuff. So uh, he did. He gave me a mantra. And I went home, and I took this, like, I took it seriously. That, for me, was a God shot. Um, well, obviously, God was totally working and orchestrating in my life. And so I did. I started, I started really meditating. I started really putting away my idea of what meditation was and working it in my life. And ever since I have, um, it's been three years. Uh, I'll be honest. It's been three years since I've really um, put the practice of meditation into my daily life, not prayer. Prayer has been in my daily life. I'm good with prayer. I pray every day. Um, but really putting meditation, really quieting myself for 15 minutes every day. When I started to do that, the connection that I had with this higher power blew up in a way that I have always wanted in my life. Um, I always wanted the connection with God. I was so mad at God for me wanting to have this connection and me wanting the healing that I saw so many religious people who had. Um, and I was being denied that. And when I started doing meditation, it was like uh, a connection that I've never had before. And that's what step 11 is, to improve our conscious contact with our higher power as we understand and paying only for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. Without meditation in my life, I would still be spinning. And um, it became such a huge and beautiful thing for me to actually get glimpses of where my mind would be quiet. And I'm not saying it was easy. It's been three years just like anything. Um, working something into your life, learning something that's new, it's like exercise, you know, you have to work it and you have to do it. And so um, for those two weeks I worked with that mantra and, and then it shifted. There was a complete shift in, in how I worked step 11. And, um, and then the next step, you know, I have become so willing to do whatever God wants to do in my life because of step 11, because of working the um, St. Francis prayer and sitting back and letting God and being, being a channel for that power, um, it was put on my heart to start a meditation meeting in the valley, and um, I was like, okay, and I fought that for about a year, I was like, oh, i got to find a space, and I don't know, it's kind of hokey, and nobody around here is ever going to do it, and it just kept coming back, and I asked Bill for some, some information, and he gave me some great tools, and um, finally it was just like, okay, I'll open up my house, and we'll have a meditation, and if, you know, two people want to come and sit with me in quiet, um, we'll have a meditation, and we'll have a meeting afterwards. That was a year and a half ago, and um, and now we have about 15 people on a regular basis that come to my house on Monday and bless me with their energy, and uh, yes, it is their energy, and I feel it, and it's the blessing of step 11 in my life is that I, my connection my conscious connection with my higher power is so tangible. It's not lip service anymore. You know, I'm not praying to something that I don't understand anymore. I understand my God because my God works in me all the time. You know, I get answers to questions like that, the part of the promises where, you know, like I have that I know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. And I can't explain it to you. I can't explain why I know. I just know what God is doing in my life because every day I pray and every day for 15 minutes, if not longer, I sit and I listen. And um, after three years having this, well, having the, the meditation meeting at my house um, is rather convenient for me when I'm working with sponsees because I kind of make that part of their, <laughs> I kind of make that part of their uh, their step work that they have to come to my meditation meeting and try it. At least you can't get it if you do it once a week, but it certainly takes the stigma 
Um, and by the way, if anyone is alcoholic, it is a closed meeting, but you're welcome to come to my house and meditate with me on Mondays at 7 o'clock. Um, see me after. But it takes that, that weirdness. I had that. I had that idea that meditation is this hokey new age stuff that um, people, you know, burn incense and chant and all of those things that I wasn't um, open to at all. But because this program has taught me to open up my mind and understand something that, that I, did, you know, I didn't understand before, um, I, I am open to suggestions. And, um, and now the practice of meditation in my sobriety um, has given me a mind, and I'm not kidding you, this is huge for me. I, I think that if you guys all have a chattering mind, I think we all do, but, um, you know, just try, try to sit still for an hour. I mean, not an hour, so do that. For a minute. <laughs> try to sit still for a minute and see if you can turn your head off. It's, it's hard. It's awful. Um, but now, three years later, after really incorporating meditation into my life, um, I, I've returned to the workforce at an office where there's a lot of distracting stuff going on and a lot of gossip. And I sit there, I just noticed it within the last month or so, where I say, shut up, you know, in my head. I just like, shut up. And it does. My head stops. It stops that process of comparing myself to everybody and getting involved in the drama and, um, you know, just all the things that don't keep me as a helpful vessel of God's peace. Um, that's a wonderful thing for me because I was never able to have that, that sort of calm and peace in my life and um, to be able to have even a couple minutes where my brain just is, doesn't, it just doesn't go there anymore is control that I never thought I would be able to have and that's something that God is doing for me that I could not do for myself. So um, when I guide somebody through Step 11, it is with a huge heart and a huge um, affection for this step because of the impact that it has had. And, and if anybody, you know, if anybody can get a little bit of the peace now, um, because the result, the other result of that is not, I mean, emotional sobriety, we, we have to stay emotional, emotionally sober because that's the, that, you know, staying in a fit condition, is our sobriety is contingent on that. And if we don't find tools that work, um, then you're just faking it, you know, and I've done that. Faking it until you make it is, is um, good, you know. Sometimes that's what you have to do. That's what I did with meditation. That's, that's the, the path that I had to get to where it finally worked, but it did work. I did fake it until it did click in my life, and I have this resource that I can go to when, when life is spinning out. Um, when I first started, I'll just really quickly uh, explain what happened in my life that meditation was so beneficial for me because when I hit three years of sobriety, I really – finally understood what to thine own self be true meant and it meant a disintegration of my life because drinking brought me to a place in my life that I didn't want to be that I wasn't supposed to be in and um, looking at that looking at the magnitude of my life and everything of it falling apart um, I swear to you that I would have drank if I didn't have this practice of being small and turning a trying to turn off my head and not um, worry about all of these pieces that had to come apart. Um, I would have never stayed sober. And so this stuff is so important to me because, um, you know, I can stand now and I can be helpful with it. I can take this um, practice that has been so beneficial in my life. I was able to go through my father's death in a way that, because um, I feel like it's, it's given me a connection to all of us. Because, you know, there's there's one higher power, and we can all, you know, call it what it is, and that's what works for us, and that's perfect. But he's all of our higher power, and um, and it connects me to all of you. And so when I lost my dad, it wasn't so scary anymore, because I had this higher power that I knew worked in my life. Before it didn't, then I would have been drinking. Um, you know, and I feel his presence with me every time I close my eyes and ask for it, and that's huge. Um, so I went through a divorce. Um and it ended up being very amicable because I was able to not create drama and not be self-serving um, even in that and not seek my will even in that. Um, and I attribute that all to getting out of my own way and meditation gets me out of my own way. Um, so when it comes to helping other people through meditation, I am very real and I am very raw with um, all that it has done for me. Because, um, you know, a divorce, losing my house, switching jobs completely, um, 
stepping out of what I thought, you know, I was a manager and I had to step down from management because I couldn't handle it all anymore. So that whole ego deflation of giving up management, which I'll never do again, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? An alcoholic of my nature should not manage. But, um, kind of control freak. Um, but uh, losing my grandmother, losing my father, all of these things happened when I was sober. And um, you have to use all the tools that are available in this program in order to get all the benefits this program can give you. Um, and, and don't discount meditation. You know, it, it, it's something I didn't want to do initially, and I'm so grateful that I had a sponsor who wasn't going to just let me go on to step 12. Because it was with that one last thing, that one last Hail Mary thing, the mantra thing that she gave me, that it finally worked for me. And um, and with it, I just started running with it. And I, w- I want to share it with whoever is open to um, seeking that peace in sobriety because it's possible. Life does happen. But you can handle it peacefully and happy. You know, you could be happy as stuff happens because you can um, trust in a higher power um, because I don't need to work it all out. Um, and I and I wouldn't have had that without prayer and, and meditation. So um, I try to, to be very real with the, the girls that I work with um, and telling them the impact that it has had in my life, where I was before. That's what we do. We share experience, strength, and hope. And um, when it comes to Step 11, um, it, it's a huge thing for me. And I am always open and available for anybody who wants to talk about it or who wants to be honest about because because I did think it was stupid. I thought it was hokey, and I don't anymore. It works, and um, and so I'm very open and, and very honest. And whatever whatever stereotype people have of me because of that, I welcome it because it's not me. It's God working in my life, and I am humble enough to allow that. Now I, I am absolutely be careful what you pray for. I'm absolutely a channel. Uh, I allow God to just work in my life, and sometimes that means stepping out into very uncomfortable things, like announcing at a meeting that there's a meditation meeting at my house and having everybody roll their eyes, it's fine because I see what happens. Those 14 souls that come into my house leave better. They leave happy, and we're able to share something that um, that isn't done very often here. So thank you very much, Bill, for letting me talk. Thank you, Luann. We... Um we had a panelist scheduled to be here today, and uh, unavoidably, um, uh, that person was not able to make it. So um, I'm kind of torn between two ideas. Uh, one is that uh, I, I have a few comments I'd like to share from my own experience, and, and I also want to be sure to leave enough time that we can adequately answer all our questions. So if you bear with me, I'd like to share a couple thoughts that I have on uh, the 11th step. Uh, I'm going to tell you that I'm an addict. Uh, my name is Bill. I, uh, when I say I'm an addict, what I mean by that is that um, that I've used alcohol and other chemicals to uh, to change the way I feel, try to feel like uh, I think everybody else feels. And um, what I found is that when I begin to uh, to put something into my body that changes the way I feel, I I end up invariably uh, behaving in ways that are contrary to my value system. And I hurt myself and I hurt other people. And uh, I wake up the next day and I'm ashamed and I'm scared and I don't want to ever do those things again. And I don't see the role that alcohol or other chemicals have played in me doing those things. And um, I live in this fantasy world where I don't see the truth about my condition. And, and, and the problem for me is that uh, in that uh, set of circumstances, I'm doomed to repeat that behavior. And I repeat it and I repeat it and I repeat it, and I get to a place where life is so painful that I just want to die. And I, I, I can't seem to die on my own, and I don't seem to have the courage to take my own life. And, and I don't know if any of you are living there today or if any of you have visited there before, but if you have or, or you are, I suspect you know the desperation with which uh, I got here. We've been sitting a long time. Uh, I hope to keep my comments brief, but we're going to do questions after this. So I'm going to invite you all just briefly to stand up if you like, kind of stretch a little bit, um, just to give you a chance to do that. It's not a break, so don't take off. I'm going to keep talking while you're stretching. But... Um, the comments that I wanted to make uh, are that, uh, in, in my experience, 
uh, prayer for me starts started well before even the first step. And may, maybe some of you have had this same prayer. Oh, God, help me! That's, uh, that's a prayer I, I, I've found a lot of us have made in common. And, um, and so I, I, I have found that in my own experience, and I've heard other people tell me the same thing, that, that prayer oftentimes begins well before we even come to the realization that, that recovery is something we, we want or, or need. Um, as, uh, as, as, as I've gone through the steps, and as I uh, work with other men going through the steps, um, I, I suggest that, uh, that the guys I work with uh, continue to ask God for help. Now, I don't know how you guys got to this, uh, to this place, but I didn't get here singing too loud in the choir. Uh, I didn't get here with a uh, fond affection for a higher power. What I got here with was a great deal of doubt, a great deal of resentment, a great deal of hurt. And uh, if there was a God that existed, I couldn't see what he'd possibly want with me except to hurt me. And I couldn't see um, any reason that I should uh, pay homage to or wish to do anything for uh, any higher power that allowed me to live in the conditions that I lived in. And so this idea of asking God for anything was not something I welcomed. But I did it anyway. And I urge the men that I work with to do it anyway. I don't, I don't require, I wasn't required and I don't require the men that I work with to know who they're talking to when they ask for this help. But I, I advise them to ask for help. I ask them, I advise them to ask for help that they not drink. And that seems to be imperative around the first three steps at least. You know, just whatever that power is, whatever name you want to give it, some of us find comfort in, in asking for power from a tree or a hill or a group of people. I'm not concerned with, with the practice as it relates to that. As long as you're asking for some help outside of yourself, to be the guy or gal sitting next to you. So we ask for help not to drink against our will or use. In um, steps 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and 10, I encourage the men to ask God for help to see the truth. Because those, uh, seeing the truth is imperative in those steps I've found. And also in steps 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, so 4 through 10, uh, I find it to be very valuable to ask God to, uh, for uh, help to face my fears. Because I'm going to confront some fears in those steps. Through this process of going through the steps, I find that uh, incrementally, that means a little bit at a time, my prayers start to uh, evolve. They start to mature. They change from, oh, God, help me, to, all right, God, what's your will, you know. I love uh, what our other panelists talked about today, about quieting the mind and, and prayer and meditation, and I love that, you know, prayer, I've heard people tell me, was, was kind of talking or petitioning or saying something to God or a higher power. And meditation is trying to listen for whatever it is that's coming back. And... um and for me, one of the one of the first prayers that, that I remember uh, was back when I was praying in, in my thoughts. I don't know if you guys have done this, and maybe some of you still do it uh, well today. I don't know. But, but for me, uh, praying in my thoughts, uh, I'll never forget this. It was a Sunday morning. I was laying in bed. I was tired. I did not want to get up. But I had this nagging thought that would not leave me alone. And the thought was, get down on your knees and pray. And I said, I ain't doing it. I am not doing it. But I couldn't shake this thought. I couldn't get rid of it. And so, out of desperation, I said, okay, fine. I'm doing the prayer, and then I'm going back to sleep. And I got down on my knees at the edge of my bed, which I'm not real big on ceremony. I, I do find sometimes it helps establish a state of humility for me to get on my knees, but I don't find that to be necessary. God listens to me no matter what position I'm in. But I got down on my knees that day, and, um, and I started to pray. Now, again, I'm doing this in my thoughts. If you could have heard my thoughts, this is, this is just about exactly what you would have heard. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day sober. I pray that you would show me your will for me. And, you know, my grandmother had a will. 
I was supposed to get my grandfather's gold watch when my grandmother died. You know my dad, that son of a bitch, I bet you he has it. And then I start thinking about the things, the violent things that happened between me and my father when I was a child. And I start MFing this guy. And I'm getting pissed. And about that time, my eyes open, and I see a picture on the nightstand. I lived alone, so I can't blame anybody else for putting it there. It's a picture of me from, like, the first grade. And I see that picture of me, and I say, yeah, how could he do those things to that cute little kid? I was cute when I was a kid. And, um, and I just got rageful. How could he do those things to that kid? And then um, this other thought entered my mind. And I don't know where the thought came from today, but the thought that came to my mind was, what have you been doing to that kid? And it shifted my perception just a little that day. And my experience with prayer and meditation has been much like that. My, my perception of myself and of you and of God have changed in some very profoundly positive ways as a result of doing this practice. And um, I wish somebody would have said to me, I say this, okay? Listen to me now. I wish somebody would have done that to me. Now, the reality is, there were probably people saying that to me, and I couldn't hear it. And even if, even if there weren't, and, and someone had, I wouldn't have listened. So I know that what I'm saying today is not necessarily going to change you, but um, I, I, I do feel that it's possible, because I don't know how God works, man, but I, I know that I have gotten hope from other people talking about being in places of desperation where I've been, and they've talked about the amazingly positive things that have changed in their life. Luann just talked about going through some very, very difficult things and not having to drink. And you know what? If you don't have the same drinking problem that we share, that won't make a lot of sense to you. But if you've got the condition, if you've got the allergy to alcohol and the mind that keeps telling you that, oh, just a little bit this time will be okay, then maybe, just maybe, you know what kind of a miracle we're talking about. So my prayers have continued to evolve and mature um, since that time. I, I pray out loud today. And uh, I, I loved what uh, Jill said. She said she talked, she uh, prays with her fiancé. You know, um, that may sound hokey, uh, and you don't have to take my word for it, but, God, I hope that you will find somebody that you love and pray with them. You will be amazed at what happens. Now, I'm a guy, and I have very typical ego uh, things. Uh, maybe that's human, actually. But, but I'll tell you, um, as a result of... Walking through the fear. See, because I'm scared to death that if I start praying in front of my wife, she's going to think I'm stupid, right? That, I'm just being honest. That's the way I think. I'm going to say something stupid. I'm going to pray wrong, whatever. And I, I, I talk myself off that ledge, and I get down, and I lead my wife in prayer. And uh, several weeks after starting that, I hear her say, my husband is the spiritual leader of a family. How is that me? How is that possibly me? So I pray with my wife. And, um, you know, um, prayer and meditation, uh, again, praying being sort of petitioning God and meditation being listening, um, I want to I give you some very practical examples of how this works for me. In step six, we ask God to reveal to us our, our character defects. And the funny thing is, is for crying out loud, we should know what they are. And for some insane reason, I don't see them. And so I pray for God to show them to me, to disclose to me the truth about my conditions and how I can change. And you know what I do then is I go, well, that's all well. I got this. As Jill said, I'm going to work on my character defects. Uh, let, me, let me tell you how this works. Um, for me, uh, I pray in the morning, every morning. I say, and I'm going to share, I'm going to share my prayer with you. I say, um, God, I pray that you would give me the courage to walk with you today. I guess that you would please guide my thoughts. Please, uh, help keep me free of, uh, selfishness, self-pity, and dishonesty. 
I pray that you would help me to embrace your will for me and help me to carry that out today. And then I follow that with some very specific prayers that I do for some people in my life, and they're kind of personal, so I won't, I won't go into some of those. Uh, but I will tell you that one of the personal things that I pray about is I ask God to show me how to love my wife and to make her feel treasured. And uh, one morning, just as I was finishing that little prayer, it occurs to me that the night before my wife was a little unsettled. She was feeling a little bit ignored because I had stayed at a, at a meeting later than I normally do the night before. So I, I didn't give her as much time as, as I normally do. And, and so she was feeling a little bit neglected. And, and the thought occurred to me, hey, jackass, you're asking God to show you how to love your wife. Why don't you get off your ass right now and go in there and hug her? Now, here's step seven in action. I got up and did it. Now, I don't tell you that to make you think I'm swell. Because if I was swell, I wouldn't have left her neglected the night before. Okay? But because of the things that I've learned in this process, I, I'm able to live a more happy and contented life than otherwise I would on my own power. I, um, I talked about prayer being uh, a critical element of, of all the steps, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I didn't say 12, but that comes next month. And so by the time we get through step 11, why is step 11, or through step 10, why is step 11 even relevant? I mean, if you've been praying to that point, why is it relevant? And the only answer I can come up with that is that uh, without step 11, I think I've arrived. Step 11 reminds me that, um, that if I want to stay happy and content and have a purposeful life, I need to continue to improve because I'm always going to fall short. I do a prayer in the evening with my wife, and um, I, uh, I, I do a, happen to agree with everything everyone said about how prayer is a very personal thing. Um, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my prayer with you, not because I hope that you'll embrace it necessarily, um, but rather because when I did, before I had this experience, I didn't know how to pray. And, uh, and, and, and I learned how to pray by going to people who knew how to pray, and they told me how they prayed, and then I developed my own way. So I'm going to tell you how I pray. If this is useful, wonderful. If not, you can disregard it. I... Heavenly Father, thank you for another uh, clean and sober day here on earth. I, uh, I pray, Lord, that you would... Uh, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I pray... I thank you for all of your blessings, and I pray that you would show me Help me to um, help me to see all your blessings, uh, share them, and to be a good steward with them all. Lord, I ask you to uh, forgive me of the, the sins um, that I've committed today, and I ask that you would please help me to become the man that you'd have me be. I ask that you help me to live in the truth. Please show me your will for me and give me the willingness and the strength to carry it out. I ask, Lord, that you would help me to uh, build your kingdom here on earth. I pray that all your children would come to know you, that they would find the joy and peace and love and freedom that I've found in you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, use me to help meet the needs of your kids. I pray for healing and for those who are suffering, Lord, I pray that they would find comfort in you. Amen. So that's the prayer I do most every night. I, I love what Luann said, too, about prayers becoming road. And sometimes I get to where I'm doing that prayer in my mind. And I gotta go, cut it out. And we'll shake it up and do something different for a few days. But for me, that prayer, and it's something that evolves, something I've been, I've been working on for months, uh, really kind of captures everything that I think I want to be praying about. Uh, our book talks, uh, uh, and actually Jill did a good job of talking about, um, some of the things that the book says on pages 86 and 87 about, about praying and, and, um, I guess there is, uh, one thing I, I might want to elaborate on. It says uh, on page 87 of the big book, it says, If circumstances warrant, we ask our wives or friends to join us in morning meditation. If we belong to a religious denomination which requires a definite morning devotion, we attend to that also. 
If not members of, a relig of religious bodies, we sometimes select and memorize a few set prayers which emphasize the principles we have been discussing. There are many books, uh, helpful books also. Suggestions about these may be obtained from one's priest, minister, or rabbi. Be quick to see where religious people are right and make use of what they offer. Now, uh, is it odd or is it God? Right? Uh, last night, uh, as I was thinking about today and what were we going to do with, you know, only three panelists, for crying out loud, if I don't show up with four panelists, you guys will all see what a fraud I am. And uh, what I'm going to share with you is a, uh, is a Christian resource. I'm not here advocating Christianity to anyone. Uh, this happens to be the brand of religion that my wife and I practice, but, but I'm not here to sell you a Bible or, or sell you on my, my faith. That's not the point. The point I want to make here is that, uh, for me, things outside of the fellowship have also proven to be very helpful. And uh, last night, uh, in this daily reflection, I read two things, and I want to share them with you. It says, constant prayer means keeping our requests constantly before God as we live for Him day by day, always believing He will answer. When we thus live by faith, we are not to give up. God may delay answering, but His delays always have good reasons, and we must not confuse them with neglect. As we persist in prayer, this is the part, as we persist in prayer, we grow in character, faith, and hope. And one other comment here. It says becoming a Christian, but I would say becoming a person of faith means beginning a whole new relationship with God, not just turning over a new leaf or determining to do right. New believers have a changed purpose, direction, attitude, and behavior. They no longer seek to serve themselves, but to serve God. Can you point to any areas where having God's word has changed your life or where it should do so. And that's a great point for me to reflect on and to meditate on. God, what am I not seeing today? How can I better serve you? I'll leave you with one last thought, and then we'll go to questions. Um, I was at a meeting not that long ago, and um, I was talking a little bit about my prayer life, and I mentioned that I was praying for some people. And there was a, there was a point to why I was explaining that, but... Uh, but after I, I spoke at the meeting, uh, someone uh, later asked, why do we pray for, he, he asked, why do we pray for other people? But I would say you could ask the same question, why do we pray, right? And I felt like I should know the answer to that question, but I was stumped. I, I couldn't answer the question. I, I felt like I was supposed to know the answer, but I didn't know the answer. And so I did what I thought was a pretty reasonable thing. I went to the leaders at the church that I attend, and I said to them, I, I asked five or six of them, you know, the, the head preacher man, and then the, the music guy, and then the, the, the administrative preacher guy, and, okay? I went to all those guys, they've all been to the college for God and stuff, and I said, uh, why do we pray for other people, or why do we pray? And, uh, and, and you know what they said? Wah, 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 wah. They, they they said stuff that I was kind of sitting there going, oh, okay. I can't tell you what they said. I don't remember. It was some highfalutin explanation that, I mean, it made sense. And I don't mean to diminish their value at all. That's not the point. The point is that I couldn't really put my teeth into what they were talking about. So after I talked to them, I just happened to talk to another guy who's nobody special, right? He's just a, a, a guy, another guy that I know uh, at our church, and I, I asked him, and he said something that changed me, man. I said, why do we pray? And he goes, well, I'm glad you asked. And he said, the reason I pray is because it works. So thank you for letting me share with you. And um, what we're going to do now is go to questions. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.